acceptable in thy sight. O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Beloved in Christ, we are given this morning three examples from our readings. The church teaches us during this holy epiphany season from these three examples. The example first of Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria. He was a great man with his master and in high favor. This was a powerful man. This was a strong man. This was a mighty warrior. He had given victory to Syria by the hand of the Lord. But this Naaman was also a leper. And in Naaman we have an example. An example that we do well to follow. For Naaman in all of his might and all of his strength and all of his power. Naaman who was so highly regarded by the world. Still remained by his very nature leprous. And thus set apart. It didn't matter how many battles Naaman won. It didn't matter how great Naaman became. It didn't matter how high in esteem his king held him. Naaman was a leper, and therefore Naaman was outside of his own people. Can you imagine how difficult this would have been for him? I mean, we all know people who are like Naaman, people who are Independent, people who are strong, perhaps you are one of these people, people who like to do things on their own, people who like to make their own way, who like to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. We all know people like this. Perhaps we even know people who, like Naaman, are driven because of their weaknesses, who are driven to succeed and to do well because they have afflictions, because they have handicaps. So we can imagine well how it must have galled Naaman that no matter what he did, he would always be seen as a leper. He would have always been considered unclean and untouchable, diseased and contagious to everyone around him. And so Naaman lived with this shame. He lived in frustration. He lived in anger. He lived an unfulfilled life. Now, Naaman is an example of each one of us as well, because in your own lives there are things, there are spheres of influence in which you feel as though you are very good, you are very powerful, you have things together. And in these spheres of influence, you can deceive yourselves into thinking that you are pretty accomplished, and that because of your abilities in this area, you deserve some kind of claim. You deserve some kind of recognition. But remember from Naaman, as he bore his leprosy on his skin, you bear the leprosy of sin in your heart. And so when you stand before our Lord Jesus Christ, when you gather this morning at his word, at his command, at his promise, do not think that you come by your own merits or worthiness. Do not think as you come up to this holy altar that you are bringing something to Christ that he does not have, that you are bestowing upon him some favor because in one small part of your life you are important or you do well or people think highly of you. You come to our Lord Jesus Christ just as Naaman went to Elisha the prophet as an outsider, as one who is unclean, as one who is outside of God's chosen people, you come to Christ the same way in which Naaman went to Elisha. And let us look, continue to look at the example that Naaman gives us. How does he go to the prophet who is in Israel? How does he go to Elisha? He went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothes. He went with a letter from the king of Syria, to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. So do you come before our Lord Jesus Christ with all of your leprosy, and still presume 
to bestow on him some favor. As Naaman came with all of his riches, with ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothes, do you presume also to come before our Lord Jesus Christ with hands that are full of your own might, hands that are full of your own worth, of your own value? We continue to learn from the example of Naaman and see how well that went for him. He stands before the king of Israel, and the king of Israel trembles because the king of Israel also is an example of faithlessness to us. The king of Israel does not believe that his God, the God in whose name he has conquered, the God in, who, in whose name he rules, this king of Israel does not believe that his God can do this. You hear what he says, am I God to kill and to make a lie that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. You see, the king of Israel didn't believe. And yet, Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. Elisha, the man of God, had heard the king of Israel had been faithless, had not believed. So he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Why do you not believe? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. And so Naaman goes. You can almost imagine how grudgingly he's doing all of this too, can't you? I mean, here is a man, a great man with his master and in high favor, and he has resorted to going after a slave girl's advice, following the advice of a little slave girl of people he had conquered. And so he goes with all of his ten talents of silver, his six thousand shekels of gold, and his ten changes of clothes. He goes with his servants. He goes with his leprosy. He goes with his perceived notion of who he is and how great he is and what he deserves. And he stands before Elisha's door. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. And that was it. And Naaman will not stand for this. How dare this Elisha not even come out and face me? You can hear the anger and the frustration dripping from his words. When he says he couldn't even come out and wave his hand over the place. Do a little show for me for crying out loud. That's all I want. Somebody recognize how important I am. Take my ten talents of silver. Take my six thousand shekels of gold. Take these ten changes of clothes. And do a show for me. And acknowledge how important of a man I am. But Elisha would not do it. For Elisha is not strong and powerful on his own. Elisha knows that he is a prophet of the Lord. And a prophet of the Lord simply dispenses the word of the Lord to God's people. It is not some kind of a magic show. It's not something to make Naaman feel good about himself. Elisha's job is to proclaim the word of his God to all who would seek it. And so he proclaims this simple word, Go and wash yourself in the Jordan seven times, and you will be clean. Could I not wash in the rivers of Farpar and Abana, in Damascus, and be clean, Naaman says? But his servants are faithful. His servants looked to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. No fanfare, no trumpets. Elisha didn't do any kind of magic tricks. He didn't wave his hand over the place and cleanse him of his leprosy. He simply told Naaman to do what the Lord had commanded. Go and wash yourself and be clean. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him. And you note, there is no other blustering or boasting of Naaman here. He simply goes to the man of God, and he stands before him. All of his 
ego has been silenced. All of his feelings of self-importance and self-worth have been forgotten. For the word of the Lord has accomplished the purpose for which it was sent. And Naaman, who, despite all of his great acts, could not cleanse himself, has been cleansed by this simple, insignificant act, the word of the prophet Elisha. And he was cleansed. Beloved in Christ, we have here this example that we do well to learn from. Do not come before the Lord your God thinking you deserve something, but come rather like the other examples we are given in the Gospel reading. For behold, a leper came to Jesus and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Here we have another leper. Notice we don't know his name. We know nothing about his personality, his reputation. He is not called a great man. He is not called a mighty man of valor. He has no favor with kings. This is a simple leper, a poor beggar who, like Naaman, is utterly cut off from his people, who, like Naaman, bears in his flesh the result of sin. But unlike Naaman, this leper comes unpretentiously to the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unlike Naaman, this leper seeks out from Christ that which is needful. And you see the prayer of faith. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. He doesn't say, Lord, please, I beg you, make me clean. He doesn't say, Lord, do you know who I was before I had leprosy? If only you had seen the great things that I did before I had leprosy. Lord, I have a wife and children to take care of. None of this. This leper gives us an example of faithfulness that clings to the promises of God in Jesus Christ. This leper gives us an example of one who seeks and receives only good from his Lord and his Master, Jesus Christ. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. What a prayer of faith. All through the week, these words have stuck with me as I prepared for the sermon. This has been my prayer every day of the week. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And this is also a beautiful example of prayer for you. As you come before the altar of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. As you walk by the font in which he has made you clean, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And what does faith receive from our Lord Jesus Christ? I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. There was even less fanfare with this leper. There was no dipping in the Jordan seven times. There were no shekels. There were no talents of silver. There were no changes of clothes. The people were pressed in all around Jesus. Perhaps no one even mentioned it or noticed it. For we see that even though the great crowds followed him, Jesus said, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. All these people were gathered around Jesus and this leper, and no one noticed this man was instantly cleansed. No one noticed this prayer of faith from a heart that trusts in God and not in himself. Lord, if you will... You can make me clean. No one heard these beautiful words of Christ, these words of promise, these words of fulfillment. I will be clean. And yet it was accomplished for him. And so you gather this morning in Christ's house. You gather this morning around his word. You gather this morning around his holy altar. And the world does not notice it. The world doesn't really care. And perhaps you don't notice what's going on. But Christ has created your faith. Christ sustains your faith. And Christ gives you that faith to call upon him. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Christ gives you that answer to your prayer of faith this day saying, I will be clean. And you are cleansed. Finally, we have... The centurion of Capernaum. Another man of example. 
interesting in that he also is like Naaman. He is a military man, a man of might and valor, a man of some note and importance. He is a man who is outside of the chosen people of God, not an Israelite, but a Gentile, even as Naaman was a Gentile, and so therefore unclean. And this centurion from Capernaum comes to our Lord Jesus Christ boldly, somewhat audaciously, how dare this Gentile come to a Jewish rabbi to seek anything, and yet by faith he goes, and by faith he calls to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. Here we see further similarities between the centurion and Naaman, although there are similarities and differences, in that both of them have servants. Naaman had a little servant girl, and his servants who said, my father did the prophet say, wash and be clean? Naaman didn't really care much for his servants, other than what he would get from them. But here we have this centurion from Capernaum. And his main concern is not for his reputation, not for his name, not for his power, not for his own might, not for his own glory. What is his main concern? My servant is lying paralyzed at home. Suffering terribly. His concern is for one who is lower than he is. He doesn't care about himself. And it's important, too, that we make this distinction. He doesn't care that his servant is unable to serve him. His concern is that his servant is suffering. <laughs> and he seeks a release for his servant's suffering. And he said to him, that is, Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. This is outrageous for Jesus to do such a thing, that he would go to a Gentile's house. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, the lawyers, all of them would have jumped on this as an example of Christ's unorthodox behavior, as an example of Christ's dangerous behavior. How dare you go to a Gentile's house? How dare you even offer it? But the centurion, knowing that this is inappropriate for Christ to do, and by faith believing that Christ can do all things, says, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. Do you see how the church has given you these great and wondrous examples today? Do you see how the church has pointed you away from yourself and pointed you to Christ? Do you see how the church has taught you this day? <laughs> That we trust not in our own feelings, in our own thoughts, in our own emotions, but we trust in the unchanging eternal word of God, which was spoken to Naaman by the prophet Elijah, which is enfleshed in the person of Jesus Christ, which has been revealed to us by his holy scripture, which healed and cleansed the leper, which healed and cleansed the servant of the Capernaum centurion. Christ has accomplished this for these men. And these men, by faith, turned from death to life. These men, by faith, followed our Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in Him. And by faith, they were healed. And by faith, they have life. And so, as you leave this place, would you be ashamed of the gospel? This gospel which has accomplished all these great and beautiful things? Would you be ashamed of the gospel? No, for you know by faith that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For, it is in, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so, beloved... You shall live by faith. You shall trust fully in God's word. And you see very well how this morning I've taken that word of scripture very seriously. Giving you the whole counsel of God. I don't usually preach this long, but it's important that you hear it. We have great and wonderful examples here. How could I leave one out? So attend to God's holy word. Trust in God's holy word. Repent and turn from your sins. For the righteous shall live by faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We rise now and confess.